John Andrews, who is a former U.S. Army Master Sergeant and military science instructor, uh, now a, a historian of the Middle East. He lives in uh, Scotch Plains, New Jersey, and joined NAVA in 2019. Uh, John will be presenting and uh, clinging to the past, national unity and the rejection of Refrat Chadiji's redesigned Iraqi flag. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. My name is John Andrews, and today I'd like to talk to you uh, about a brief chapter in Iraqi history, the unsuccessful attempt to radically alter the flag during the early occupation in 2004. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, we'll talk about the failed redesign, uh, what Iraqis ended up, ended up going with. And finally, we'll say something about successful redesign efforts like Canada. Uh, doubtless, we're all familiar with the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. Without the defeat of Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party, a change to the Iraqi flag would not have been possible. Above all, we should remember that these changes in 2004 and in 2008 happened under pressure. Invasion, insurgency, and civil war all played a part. Iraq was invaded in March of 2003, following fears that it possessed weapons of mass destruction, an idea with tremendous purchase in the post 9-11 world. Along with the UK and other allies, the US defeated Iraq and established an interim government, the Coalition Provisional Authority. The CPA had tremendous control over occupied Iraq and directed the establishment of a new government. The CPA undertook uh, the process of debathification. The Ba'ath Party had ruled Iraq since the 1960s and is strongly associated with Saddam Hussein. Under L. Paul Bremer, the CPA effectively removed two million Iraqis from public life. Of its many projects, one that's relevant, set, relevant to us today is the replacement of the Iraqi flag. The CPA established the Iraqi Governing Council, IGC, an interim post-Saddam body. This placed, Iraqi, placed an Iraqi face on the CPA. The IGC is the actual body that oversaw the redesign effort. So um, let's say something about that actual redesign. 2004, the IGC solicited designs for an Iraqi flag. Most of these were rehashed uh, examples of Iraq's flag from the 20th century. And this is the flag um, they ended up going with. This is a very unpopular flag. It was, uh, very much dislike, and it is not the one that, that ended up coming to pass. So what says something about this guy here, Rafat Chadichi. Um, Chadichi was a renowned uh, architect. He's sometimes known as the father of Iraqi architects, and he's a public intellectual. He's focused on minimalist and forward-looking designs. However, he lived abroad from the 1980s onwards and may have developed mm -hmm. ideas about Iraqi society, which were wildly out of step with the uh, Iraq of 2004. Let's take a look uh, at this flag. Uh, this is a unity flag that attempted to triangulate elements of Iraqi society. Here we have white that symbolizes purity and a new start for Iraq, a crescent moon, which symbolizes Islam. Our yellow stripe here is for Iraqi Kurds who had previously uh, not had representation on the flag in some time. And our two blue stripes here are actually rivers, which are the Tigris and Euphrates River, uh, strongly associated with Iraq and its uh, Mesopotamian past. Uh, let's so uh, some design features. We'll jump into there as well. Um, yellow has long been associated uh, with Kurdish ethnicity. Kurdish representation appeared on earlier versions of the Iraqi flag. However, this led some to believe that perhaps there was a de-emphasis on Arabs. Uh, the colors of, of pan-Arab colors or the colors of out Arab liberation are out. And this is the colors of the flag behind me and are replaced um, with this new design. So some led to believe that they were being minimized on their own flag. Here we have some examples uh, of the flags that share Chiritri's most uh, notable feature, which is a centralized icon. Uh, Chiritri was inspired by minimalist designs of Canada and Switzerland. And we can see a number of examples that are just like that. Bangladesh, Japan, Turkey, New Mexico, et cetera. We also have water symbolism. Now this is important because it provides a, a symbolically neutral space on the flag. As Iraq has a riverine culture in many areas, this is perhaps the least controversial element of the design. Here we see many flags of nations associated with water, mostly island nations like Nauru, Kiribati, and the Seychelles. And on the bottom left, we see the Gambian flag, and that's perhaps the closest uh, nation with the association to Iraq with its waterways. Both Gambia and Iraq were shaped by their respective waterways. 
Additionally, I, I would not be surprised if Chedechi worked into a hidden design element into the flag, which mimics, mimic the historical architecture of Iraq. Here we have two memorials. One design by Chedechi is on the bottom right. Uh, his design, um, his designs recall the Iraqi ruins up here we have here of Testafon, uh, others from about the 100s. And there are other famous arches throughout the country. And, and, and I, I, it's a pet theory right now, working theory, that he installed a hidden arch on the flag that was just below the surface and a feature that probably would have only been present if we had turned the flag on its side or it had become an item of everyday use. So why then was the flag rejected? Well, I, I fought this for many years, um, but I, I think it's, its similarity to Israel's flag is perhaps the most understated uh, reason that the flag is rejected. The similarities between the two flags is hard to miss, especially when they're placed side by side. And it's likely that Chodochi as an expat um, saw Iraqi identity a little bit different than those who were living under occupation, who were living through years and years of war, and were living in a, in a, in a country that was not shaped by its dislike of Israel, but of one that saw Israel as an enemy. The Iraqi-Israeli relations are not great. Uh, the two nations were enemies from 1948 onward, though they never came into direct confrontation and land combat. Iraq contributed troops to Arab incursions against Israel several times. The Iraqi missile attacks on Israel during the Gulf War, perhaps the best known example of direct action. For Israel's part, there are instances of unilateral action against the Iraq. In 1981, a brazen air raid destroyed the Iraqi nuclear power plant and taking with it the country's nuclear weapons program with it. It's also suspected that Israel Intelligence Service assassinated Canadian engineer Gerald Bull, who was supervising a weapons program directed against Israel. For Iraq's part, Saddam Hussein championed Palestinian nationalism to varying degrees from 1990 onward. This is often included associating Saddam with images of the defense of the Temple Mount and Alaska Mosque. There was a casual relationship between Saddam and Arafat, though the exact nature of this um, relationship is in question. Saddam also authorized cash payments to Palestinians deemed worthy, typical families, typical family, uh, families who had members who were family members who were killed fighting Israel. So uh, the flag dies. Uh, there's widespread condemnation of the flag, though it's unclear if anyone actually saw one flying. Uh, there are reports of sightings, but few, if any, pictures of the flag in, in the wild, so to speak, uh, have been covered or recovered. There were also new allegations of graft and corruption level at Tradici. His brother was an IGC member. And there was never a national referendum on the flag. When the matter was bogged down in an unpopular uh, regime under US occupation, flirting with the design reminiscent of Iraq's enemy, um, the flag was withdrawn. Where did post-Saddam take its vexillography? Well, takes it right back to Saddam. So let's look at the state of Iraqi flags under the Ba'ath Party. There are two versions here of the Iraqi flag. The 1963 flag was instituted after Iraq's third military coup and retained, uh, remained until 1991 when Saddam changed the Iraqi flag on the eve of the Gulf War. The 19, in 1963, Iraq adopted a new flag based around its hopes of joining the United Arab Republic. This was a political union of Syria and Egypt in which Iraq never joined. It would have had a star convention which indicated the order of the nation had joined the UAR. It's the reason why Syria's flag has, has two stars on it. When Iraq didn't join the UAR, they were stuck with the stars and reimagined them symbolizing the Ba'ath Party slogan, unity, freedom, socialism. The Ba'ath, a resistance party, was a socialist pan-Arab party that developed into a totalitarian uniparty system. Which brings us to Saddam and the Takbir. Takbir is a declaration of Islamic piety, meaning God is the greatest. It speaks to the Islamic concept of divine supremacy and the rejection of association of earthly things or persons uh, with his authority. Iraq added the Takbir to the flag in 1991 during the Gulf War. Its purpose was to invoke the divine purposes of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and to paint Saddam as an agent of godliness. The Takbir was supposedly written in Saddam's handwriting, though there's been some research on this matter, but, but really who knows. Here's what it looks like. Um, we'll take a look at it on the flag. Here we have the flag. We interpose these in between our UAR stars. This is allegedly Saddam's handwriting. Who knows? Down here we have it in its modern standard Arabic, Allahu Akbar. We read that from right to left. So rather than start over, Iraq basically kept the flag they had. Saddam's handwriting is swapped out and replaced with a block letter script called Kufic. This removes Saddam, but does it really? Some members of the IGC were reluctant to remove the name of God from the flag. 
they needed to get that flag finished. And this iteration was chosen. It was very safe and it, and it is the one they ended up going with. In 2004, the redesign was debuted for the first time in the Olympics. Iraq made a good showing of soccer, nearly capturing the bronze medal. They lost to Italy, won nothing, and a major boost for the war-torn nation. In, in Iraq and its flag and, and soccer as, as, as moments of, of nationalism become even more relevant in 2007. In 2008, um, under political pressure from Kurdish politicians, Iraq moves to take one final step, which is to remove its Bathy UAR stars, which were done so. The Kufik Takbir remains, and this is the flag that is currently in use. Iraqis are a flag waving people, um, that's a generalization, but a, a flags find itself into political discourse in Iraq. Today, the 2008 flag is associated with nationalism during the ISIS war and as a symbol of popular protests, which are common in the 2019 and early uh, 2020. Now, I thought with our time remaining, um, I thought we'd say something about consensus and redesign. Um, we had you know, wonderful conversation earlier about how flags are, are, are created, especially at the municipal level. Um, but I thought, you know, something with Canada and the ability to, you know, come to an agreement on what a flag should, a flag should look like um, is worth saying something about. Now, Canada is, uh, is probably perhaps the most successful modern redesign and worth, you know, saying something about comparisons um, to Chariuchi. So if his design was based on the Canadian flag in that it is something that is simple and has meaningful symbolism associated with, um, their, respective dis their respective design situations could not be more dissimilar. Uh, like Iraq, Canada had a long-serving national flag, the Union Jack and the Red Ensign, which became it. So how are Canadian and Iraqi flags um, different? Well, unlike Iraq, um, Canadian redesign was made without external pressure. Iraq, uh, Canada probably took, I believe, four or five years to get it together. They had artists, they had historians, they had panels, they had everything they could possibly do. Also, no one was invading uh, Canada at the time. They weren't at war. They didn't have a, a flag that they absolutely had to get rid of. It was something that they could take their time in and get as many people on board because there was, there was no need to get rid of it. It likewise saw compromise, consensus, and a consensus in a very, very lengthy debate. It almost didn't happen for a little while. And the Canadian flag was subject to a democratic process. It was drawn from meaning symbolism grounded in Canadian history. And that's something while Chaderci had rivers and he had a moon and all this kind of stuff, it, it's just too radical of, of a flag. It took a long time to get to this flag and it was something that, you know, basically Iraq's um, 2004 flag um, never really had the chance to get off the ground. So I guess we should close this out. What's the least we need to know? So some main ideas I thought we would circle back to. The 2004 occupation and the debathification efforts drove the creation of this flag. It, in an effort to get it, get it done, to get the flag up the pole, to show formally, very, very formally, in a visible way that old Iraq is dead and new Iraq is here, those in positions to make decisions rushed and they ended up creating a flag that nobody was happy with and furthermore if your aim was to separate iraqis from their old flag you actually ended up driving them towards them the design while not innovative well while very innovative and it checked all the bo box and it's a beautiful flag and it uses meaningful symbolism simple colors a child could draw it etc cetera, etc cetera, all the all the things which we're familiar with it did not incorporate the critical realities of 21st century Iraqi identity and the situation and the context in which this change was happening. As a result, Iraqis clung to their previous flag, which is the, the, the tiniest fig leaf of a reconfiguration. And I think if anything we take from this, we said, you know, without consensus, redesigning flag is, is, is an uphill battle and it, it, is, it is likely um, likely to not work. So I'm John Andrews, thank you for your time and back to you, Stan. Uh, John, thank you very much uh, for giving us some insights. We have uh, uh, questions uh, about those uh, insights and, and the information that you've presented. So why did Kurdish politicians want the stars removed again? 
They were using it as a wedge issue. Um, there was a there was a national conference going on that was a it was a governance a governance issue. They threatened to walk out of negotiations that were happening in 2007, 2008. If they didn't get some kind of consensus, um, this ended up being a, a really more of a domestic policy issue. Um, Kurds and the association with, with Saddam Hussein and, and Ba'ath Party to include chemical weapons attacks. Kurds had basically been a war with Baghdad since 1964. Um, so this was a good thing for Kurdish politicians at home to force some kind of consensus. And if they couldn't get a flag redesign, which no one wanted that again in 2008, it was, it was really kind of just tweak a, a little bit. And uh, Shia politicians were another huge voting bloc. They were not on board um, with, a, with another radical redesign. So they kicked the can again in 2008. And that is the flag that, that they came up with. And it's the one they had today. Gotcha. Did uh, did you find any because of the the uh, you know religious groupings and things? Did you find that there was significantly different resistance to adopting that new flag uh, geographically? I I don't I don't know. And the 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 problem with the everybody hate it hated it thing. When when I search for sources. You can you can find Arabic sources, you can find some local sources, right? But it's almost always I hate that flag because of X. The majority of the reporting I have is English language reporting. It's from correspondence in Baghdad. Hmm. For for all we know, and, and this is just a story about this and something that is very difficult to get our arms around. Before we know, nobody saw it. Before we know it, a, a very tiny amount of people um, were upset by this, and it just kind of became this thing, and that there is a a Baghdadization of Iraqi politics where the CPA, the IGC, the high command, the state department, all these are, are kind of in a nexus and they may kind of be in a, in, a, in a little bit of a star chamber. And that might make a flag that's a poor design, but it also might amplify the reaction to that poor design in a way that may have been a little bit artificial. And without national mm -hmm. polling or regional polling, um, it's, just, it's just not there. It's tough to say. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions here, but a, a fast one first. Did you, is there a reason why you chose the flag that you did for your background? Is, is one individual asked, is that your favorite of the versions or what's the story behind that particular one? If for practical reasons, because if I just have the, if I just have the 2008, if I sit back, <laughs> you lose the stars and it ends up, it ends up looking like Egypt's flag. That's what, what, what it ends up looking like. No, there's not, there's not a particular, I, I would say that I used to love the 2004 flag and for, until I really started putting some brain work in it. And I actually don't like it at all. Now I went, com I really went complete, complete 180 on it. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I think you and I spoke before I was there when the flag yep. was, was adopted and supposedly, and I think it might've even been in stars and stripes or something, yep. uh, you know, and we never saw it. <laughs> yeah, never saw it. Just heard about and, it. Yeah, and uh, and the only reason we heard about it because it was in our reporting, not in yeah. anything we saw from the uh, from the Iraqis. Uh, okay, can we flip uh, one of the perspectives that you gave us? Uh, someone uh, has asked the question about how the Israelis felt about the flag. That's a that's a great question. Um, I'm sure there's reporting on it. You know, I've, I've never done it, and I, and that is something that I will remedy. Um, Israeli reporting, you know, and Israeli political reporting and opinion reporting is so is so prevalent. And um, that's actually some someplace I will take my research. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Do you think it might be easier because there's, uh, from what I've found, uh, uh, significant Israeli reporting in English? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's not just a stat like it, it is it is today doing today doing research in Arabic my Arabic is okay. It's not great, but it's not, it's not as hard as it used to be digitally. It is the digital resources available to just translate in, 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 in the, to begin with. Iraqis are still largely getting their news from, from Arabic language, television, newspapers, local radio. And, you know, there's no Iraqi CNN, you know, there's things like <laughs> BBC Arabic, you know, those things are out there, but BBC Arabic is the BBC in Arabic. And, you know, they, they do focus on regional issues and regional voices. But I, it's not clear that those sources would be any more authoritative than anybody else that had wire service or who had correspondence in Baghdad in 2004. 
Gotcha. Okay. Uh, one last one here. Uh, do you know the opinion of modern Iraqis on the 1959-63 flag? And uh, the individual says, uh, I imagine the regime might kill any chances of readoption. So the 15, the 5963 flag, um, that there was a, a version of, of it, of a redesign in 2004, where they had incorporated this, this, this son of Ishtar, right? This, this Ishtar star, which is on the center of the, the, the 5863 flag. Um, I, I was, I was involved in a podcast in March, um, on this topic. I, I was on Kerning cultures is a, like a B, it's like a NPR for the middle East. And, um, I gave an inter I gave a decent interview, but they chopped they chopped me down to like two little sound bites, but they made me sound good, so I guess I couldn't feel bad. And there was talks about maybe a new redesign that harkened back to something like that with with Iraq's Mesopotamian um, past. The color scheme of the the fifty eight sixty three flag, I, I don't think that's especially remarkable, but it's that it has the inc inclusion of yellow in it, and that it has a Kurd it could in theory have a Kurdish nod but that it had a Mesopotamian element to it that was ethnically and sectarianly neutral. I don't sectarianly is, is a word. So when you have Mesopotamian symbolism in Iraq, well, Mesopotamians are, are dead. There are literally no Mesopotamians left. There are no, there are no people that worship Ishtar, I assume, right, in large scales. So it becomes this kind of vacant space that people can invest a national identity into without being tied to a specific ethnic position. And while I don't think that that symbolism per se is likely to come back, I think if we do see alterations to Iraqi state iconography, I, I believe it will be that way. I believe, I believe it will be about a remote past and a pre-Islamic past. That's just my hunch. Interesting. Okay. Uh, one quick one uh, before we move on. Uh, how did the designer take the reaction to the flag and its overarching uh, rejection? Great question. Um, so the he, he passed away COVID last year. The estate is, extre is extremely reticent about this flag. I have reached out on multiple occasions. I know other people have as well. We don't know. And and this is this is why. This is a man who designed hundreds of buildings. He was an internationally rec rec recognized public intellectual. Um, and if you think about his legacy, that's what when you search his name, that's what comes up, right? Most of his architecture was destroyed by the regime. A lot of his big buildings were in Mosul. They were either blown up by ISIS. There was a very famous design that ISIS used for execution of gay people. Like there's, there's a lot of his legacy, the, the literal physical accomplishments that Chaderchi has, they're gone. They're wiped, they're wiped out. Um, that big arch that they had, that, that was torn down by Saddam Hussein. Um, that's actually in what's called Ferdo Square, which is where the big statue that that was pulled that Saddam was pulled down by that M88 record. That was where that was that that whole thing was porn and, and supervised by Chaderchi. And you, you, it's it's tough to see someone of such a great mind and a great intellect and a great accomplishment to have his accomplishments ruined and then replaced, you know, in the in public eye with something that um, is, is ill conceived and does not paint him in a good light. And that's why I think. You know, if you go to, to if you go to his, his website, it, it's like it never happened. It, it's strictly photographs from the old regime that he worked under, and he he worked across both regimes. He was not on the outs outs with Saddam Hussein. That that's not true. Um, and and I probably in the future we'll probably see some kind of unity with that unity of it, but some kind of reconciliation with his role in this chapter of Iraqi history and and what it hoped to achieve and and why the country was not ready. Maybe I'll write that paper. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll write that one someday. Terrific. Uh, and I just want to clarify one thing that you're aware of. Uh, there are no extant element, uh, examples of the, of the flag. Uh, I have never seen one. I, I, I have, I've heard reports of people burning them, stomping on them. I have never, I have never seen one. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I, I heard a rumor that there were 3000 of them in a warehouse in Kuwait. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if that's true. And one of the things that's very interesting about the Middle East is that, that a lot of times even things that we would be able to know about our own culture, which we, we would be able to know about Europe, it's just not there, you know, and it, it would it would really take on the ground reporting, knocking on doors, asking people questions and that I that would I don't see that going over really well, especially now, even gotcha. now. All right. Well, John, thank you uh, for thank you. Uh, another terrific topic and uh, the information that you provided to the membership. Very much appreciate it. Uh